and welcome to FS Digital Events and today's Role Model Career Masterclass. Welcome to everyone joining us this morning. Our guest speaker joining us today will be telling their career stories and sharing experiences and then we will invite the audience which is comprised of students joining us from, from home um, to ask questions. My name is Neelam Jagay and I will be hosting the session today and we hope to support students to make informed decisions about, about their future choices when it comes to careers and we really want to offer you some career guidance and some lessons and tips. So to the audience at home, your audio, your video and your chat function has been disabled for safeguarding purposes, but you can interact with us using the Q&A box that you'll see on your screen. So please do ask as many questions as you, as you like and we will try to cover those towards the end of the session. We are recording the session and it will be featured on our YouTube channel. So enjoy the webinar. First of all, I would like to introduce you all to our guest speakers, Chris Windley and Hugh Welch. Thank you so much for giving us your time today to um, sort of share your career story. Um, and without further ado, I'm going to sort of hand over to you. So what we'll do is we'll spend sort of seven minutes each talking about our uh, talking about your career story and then we'll hand over to the audience if that's okay and i do have a couple of questions myself as well i'll be looking at your linkedin profiles and i'm really really curious um to hear all about your journey so we'll start off with chris so chris if you could spend seven minutes talking to us about where you started off and um you know how you got to where you are today and your experiences around your you know the various careers that you've had throughout your lifetime that would be fantastic so over to you chris and then we'll hear from you okay well good morning everybody um thanks very much for uh, listening to me so so basically i'll go back to i suppose roughly when i was about like 10 or something like that so my my father was in the royal air force and uh, he was he was basically um, an aero engineer so he was what they call uh, an airframe engineer um, in the Royal Air Force so what that meant was that um, from being a baby up to about 10 we moved all around the world to different REF stations um, and uh, and those were mainly in the UK some in Germany um, then my parents unfortunately got divorced when I was about 10 and we were living, and, and then we were living at that time in the rugby area of the Midlands. Um, and um, I uh, passed my 11 plus exam. So I ended up going to a grammar school, what we called a grammar school in, in them days, <laughs> right? Um, now, uh, I then went to an, uh, a couple of uh, rather excellent uh, grammar schools, rugby and Cowbridge. Uh, they were top grammar schools at their time. Uh, but I didn't really want to do anything in school um, and so in the end um, they suggested I left. Uh, so I, I left um, at about age 15 and I went to basically work in a supermarket chain, in a spa supermarket chain um, and I worked for a really entrepreneurial guy who was building up a chain of shops. Um, and uh, and to be honest, with you I'd, I'd never changed that because it was brilliant, <laughs> right? So so I left school, but I had no qualifications, um, but I just had a, had a brilliant job. Um, and then uh, I got a bit bored of it, to be honest with you. So uh, I decided um, I came up to live with my dad in Birmingham for a bit, and then I just decided for no particular reason to join the navy, uh, to join the Royal Navy. So I joined. The Royal Navy in the in the careers office in Birmingham at um, age 18, um, and of course I because I had no qualifications, I had to go in at the very lowest level, <laughs> the, literally the lowest level. Uh, but when I got in there, the Navy is actually a great place if you want to um, advance quickly. Um, so basically, uh, I got the O levels and A levels that I should have got in school when I was in the Navy. Um, and then I passed um, what they call the Admiralty Interview Board in the Navy, which basically means um, that I could become an officer in the Navy. So, so I passed that um, and then they sent me to university. So I went to a Naval University where basically I studied um, electronics and communications. Um, and then I went back in the Navy 
um, as what they call a weapons engineer officer. So I used to look after all the missile, sonar, radar, and communication systems. Um, and I was a, spe a specialist in what's called electronic warfare and uh, electronic countermeasures. So basically, um, back then I learned how to fight, if you like, electronically. <laughs> um, and then um, after nine years in the Navy, I left and I, I went to various um, information technology companies. Uh, so basically I was doing, you know, computers, communication, stuff like that. Um, and then I ended up starting my own company, um, which I started with two friends uh, for £6,000. And then we sold out for £75 million. Um, so, and, th and then basically... I sort of retired then, but um, I've been investing in and working with lots of different high-tech companies. And just lately, in the last three years, um, with a friend of mine from the Navy, actually, I got into cybersecurity. Um, so uh, he and I basically um, have been building cybersecurity companies for the last three years, which have actually, of course, become really super important <laughs> in terms of what's going on at the minute that's a whistle stop tour Neela. that's brilliant thank you so much um let I me mean, know there's lots more that i want to know chris um but yeah thank you for sharing so far what i really found interesting there is that you you actually i mean did you kind of write off university and then you were actually given an, an opportunity to to go to university is that right <laughs> I never even thought about university. <laughs> all I could think, of, all I could think about was how quickly could I get out of school. <laughs> so, it never even occurred to me to go to university. <laughs> so how, how did you, how did you find the transition then? Not ever thinking about university, and then actually having this amazing opportunity. How how did you transition? How did you adapt? Oh, okay. Well, for me, going to university was a means to an end, right? So, so basically, uh, to be an engineer officer in the Navy, I had to get a, a degree, right? Which was, you know, quite bizarre because, you know, I, I'd, I'd love to meet some of my teachers and that, you know, who were my maths teachers and that, because they would never have believed that I got a degree <laughs> that involved pure and applied maths and engineering. <laughs> wow. That's amazing. Thank you so much for sharing, Chris. So we will pause there for the moment um, and then we will open up to the audience as well. So guys, if you have any questions, now is the time to ask those. Uh, meanwhile, we're going to hand over to Hugh. So same for you, Hugh. If you could just spend about seven minutes talking about where you started and how you got to where you are today. Well, Dave, thank you. Thank you, Neelam. Well, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's quite amusing, really, because there's a lot of similarities between uh, Chris's route to where he got to and mine in actual fact. Um, so I'm, I'm Hugh Welsh, I'm the, the European Managing Director for a company called Kiosera SGS. Um, and we're a tool making company. Um, we turn over about nine million pounds per year and we supply uh, carbide cutting tools to the bigger aerospace companies, uh, Rolls-Royce, GKM, Boeing and Airbus and companies like that. Uh, and uh, slightly later than Chris's parents, but my, my parents divorced when I was 13. And uh, that's quite disruptive for a young person's life. I can, I can uh, un understand that. Uh, but now I'm a father of three. I have two boys aged 20 and 18 uh, and a rather more troublesome daughter who's 13. Um, so I've got a little bit of experience of, of growing young people. So uh, my route to where I am now is, uh, is uh, also slightly uh, unconventional. In that uh, I also didn't do well at school and I, I actually left with no qualifications as well. Uh, however, it didn't take me very long to work out that that's, uh, that's a bit of a mistake. Um, so I applied for, for lots of jobs when I left school, but with no qualifications, your, your options are, are quite, quite few and far between. Um, so it was somewhat fortuitously, the only person who had given me a job was actually my dad. Um, so I started a four year apprenticeship um, with my father in a, in a small subcontract engineering company. And I remember day one working for my dad, stood at a little capstan lathe, um, and I realized, oh dear, I wish I'd worked harder at school. So uh, 
I had, I had to enrol at Technical College, Chippenham Technical College in Wiltshire, uh, and started a four-year apprenticeship, which I, I really enjoyed. Um, however, um, after two years, I plucked up the, color, uh, the courage to, uh, to look at other courses to uh, kind of broaden my horizons uh, and started a course in, in business and finance, uh, which was two evenings a week. So I had to invest a bit more of my time to kind of progress my career. Um, towards the end of my, my, my college courses, uh, I had a, a lecturer who was a really, really lovely guy. And uh, he mentioned to me, did I realize I had enough qualifications to go to university? And again, similar to Chris, I'd never thought about university. My family didn't do that sort of thing. It wasn't, it wasn't what we did. Um, but I did enroll at Southampton uh, Solent University and I enrolled in, in uh, an engineering degree course. Um, I started the first year and I'll be honest, I passed, but I really scraped through. And again, I realized why you need to work hard at school because it didn't come easily to me. So uh, I actually um, transferred uh, into a media and, and cultural studies course and eventually graduated with a 2-1, uh, but age 26 and somewhat later than most people leave university. Uh, I then set about applying for jobs. Um, I applied for 150 jobs and uh, I didn't get any jobs in the media. I had no experience, um, no relevance in the media, so just kept coming up against closed doors. Again, somewhat fortuitously, a, a pal of mine from, from earlier in, in engineering phoned me up and said that a local tool making company was looking for, for engineers, and that's really when my, 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 my career started. So uh, I soon worked out that, that those that say yes when opportunities uh, come around generally do better than people who are, are shy and say no. Um, and ultimately, over, over seven years in that business, um, I became the, the manufacturing manager and the guy who recruited me in that business actually ended up working for me, which was quite unusual um, and a little bit scary. But, uh, but again, uh, I, was, I was rather lucky that opportunities came my way. Um, the company that I worked for uh, then bought a company in the Midlands. Uh, so uh, I relocated to uh, uh, South Derbyshire, where I live now, and, and managed a company of 160. Uh, which was significantly bigger than wh where I'd started um, and was very, very scary. I don't mind saying that was a, that was a big transition. Uh, the MD of the business uh, retired and I hoped to, to get that role, but unfortunately I was overlooked and I was, I was very disappointed. Um, soon after I was approached by the company I work for now, SGS, they were looking for an operational leader and was I interested? And actually, yes, I was. So. So uh, I didn't relocate my family, um, but I, they, they stay in South, in South Derbyshire while I weekly commute down in Wokingham and Berkshire, which presents its own challenges, but it's, it's okay, it, it works for us. So I guess it comes back to what I've learned through my working career. I think the first thing is you should work hard at school. Um, if you don't, it will take you longer to get to where you wanna be. Uh, the second thing is that we are blessed in this country with a fantastic education system where it's never too late to change your, your career or redirect your career to where you want to get to. Uh, the next learning point is listen to those that have your best interest at heart. Um, people that care about you will always try and guide you and you should take some notice of that. Um, and if you're interested in progressing your career, say yes, not no. Um, also, even if your career doesn't take the, the course that you expect or, or you hope for, persevere and have faith that it's for the good and you will still get there. Um, but don't lose hope. Um, you, you can improve your chances um, of getting where you want to be by being positive in your general outlook. Um, but the, the main thing is, is don't let mistakes hold you back. We are all different. We all flourish at different speeds and at different times in our lives. Uh, and if we stay positive, setbacks are lessons that we need to learn um, to make us more resilient and more prepared for when the opportunities come our way. And that's what I wanted to share with you guys today. Again, thank you so, so much, Hugh. That was really, really inspirational. Some really, really good lessons as well. Um, so, yeah, we've got loads of questions coming in. So thank you to the both of you for sharing um, so openly as well. And definitely lots of similarities um, that you've, you've highlighted there. And I want to touch on one 
Um, and I know there's some questions about this as well, but um, Hugh, you mentioned, you know, rejections in terms of jobs, applying for, was it 150 jobs in around sort of the media sector and, and having rejections. Um, and Chris, same for you, you know, having to transfer and, and, and rethink things and, you know, taking new opportunities. You had a lot of setbacks, clearly, the both of you. Um, and we hear, the, we hear this word uh, sort of resilient, you know, being resilient. And I really want to hear your thoughts on this sort of this word that everyone's talking about being resilient and, you know, sort of, you know, just, you know, doing what you have to do and, and getting on with things. And, and how, how, do you, how does a young person develop resiliency? So Hugh, should we start off with yeah. you? We'll ask Chris the same question. Sorry. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> the, phrase I would, the phrase that comes up a lot is emotional resilience. And I think it's, it's accepting that maybe now is not your time, that actually you're not the best person for a role at that particular time. You have to learn that, okay, what is it that I'm lacking that the other guy had, or the other person, should I say, because it cuts both ways, but what is it that I need to learn to be the right person next time round? And that, that's the learning opportunity. That, that should be the stimulus to kind of drive you forward to accept that, um, but not be, not be rejected by it. That, that take the opportunities um, that that presents. Excellent. How about you, Chris? What are your thoughts on this term resilience? Yeah, well, it's a really interesting, actually, listening to Hugh. So um, I've sort of been working on a book um, uh, recently of my life. And... Um, and I realized when I was going through it, and I think this is true of Hugh as well, that actually there were key people in my life that helped me during the journey, right? Um, and I think, you know, and you could almost call those people angels, you know, it might be too strong a term, but they're sort of like angels, right? And you've got to basically, um, for the, you know, for that to happen, to be guided by people, You've got to be sensitive to that, right? And, and, and obviously, one thing that you don't that you ever do is burn your bridges, as we call it, right? So try never to fall out with anybody. Just walk away from it, because you never know if you'll meet them again, if you like, in the future. But, but you know, I think just to, just to match, you know, what you said there, there are some key people um, in my life that have really helped me when I've not known what to do next. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I'm going to hand over to the audience because we've got a few questions coming in. Um, someone is asking, this, is, this one's for you, Chris. I would, like to get, I would like to have a career in cyber security. What would I need to study at school? Any okay. Well, that's really interesting. I could just tell you that I've got... Um, a daughter, uh, I better not say how, how old she is, but um, she's probably twice the children's ages here, roughly. <laughs> and, um, she, and she actually, so when she was a teenager, she did, um, uh, she did like Cisco and Microsoft qualifications at college, yep. basically. Um, so I think, you know, and um, so obviously she'd done, you know, the, the, the main, you know, typical subjects, you know, math, math English, etc. Um, but just recently, um, she has uh, started doing cybersecurity courses herself and what's called ethical hacking courses. Um, and so she's actually gone back to, she found uh, an open university, I think it was, course um, that was in conjunction with um, a, a place that I work with at the minute, called GCHU and the National Cyber Security Centre, right? So basically it's, an, it's a course that's actually approved by GCHU and the National Cyber Security Centre. Um, so, you know, uh, people should be aware, I'm sure they probably are, there are massive opportunities in cyber security at the minute, right? And very highly paid jobs mm -hmm. and that. Um, and also, uh, to your point, Neelam, our fantastic education system, right, is actually providing the opportunities to get trained in those areas, right? Um, so obviously, as Hugh says, yeah, you know, work hard on the, the basic subjects, you know, maths, English, etc. cetera. Um, but you can always come back to it and you can always, you know, there's always some support there, if you like, to help you to get to the next stage. Absolutely, absolutely. 
And another one, Hugh, uh, this one's more for you, I think. Um, if I want to be an engineer, am I best to get an apprenticeship? Um, absolutely. What, what, what are your thoughts? Absolutely. I mean, this is one of the things that um, I, I brought to the business where I am now is we take three apprentices a year. Uh, we work with uh, Farnborough College where we have a pipeline. Uh, many uh, educational establishments um, across the country have MVQ qualifications that people can, can look at in, in civil engineering or in our case, mechanical engineering or electrical engineering. Um, those, there's a variety of engineering courses that you can, you can look at. Um, or alternatively, you can obviously look at if you've got the, 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 the grades and you get, the, get, a, get a, a good kind of level at A level, you can go straight to university and go for, for graduate schemes as well. So again, um, we have a, a matrix of, of education, great education system, um, that really depending on your, your, your skills and capability, you can pitch yourself at all levels. Um, and again, never too late if you start on the wrong course, you can always redirect and retrain in something else at any time in your in your in your life. Absolutely. And do do your companies offer internships? Well, from our from our point of view, yes, we we do a lot with um, um, universities in the UK and in France. In actual fact, we we have probably two interns a year where they come and do their their sandwich course of their degree um, with us, and we provide them with an opportunity to get real life hands-on engineering experience. So that's, that's for us. Amazing, how about you, Chris? Yeah, so just a couple of things actually, just to mention here. So, um, I, I, you know, I've got a number of hats. If, if, you, if, you, if you've looked at my LinkedIn, you'll see that. So, so the two main companies that I work with at the minute, uh, one's called uh, Lou Jam Cyber Security, and the other is a long title, it's Business Resilience International Management, right? Um, so Lou Jam Cyber, just briefly, actually, we're, we're literally just looking for interns. Um, we're, obviously, we're, we're norm nominally based in the Bristol area. Um, so we've got some funding, actually, from the University of the West of England, UWE, I think it is. Yeah. Um, so we're, we're literally, um, we'll be taking on some interns, uh, and we have already, by the way, uh, taken on interns um, in Lou Jam. Uh, Business Resilience International Management is rolling out across the UK at the minute, something which I, which I think is very interesting, which uh, the young people will find interesting. So we're, with the police, we're rolling out um, business and cyber resilience centres, right? And those uh, business and cyber resilience centres are 50% staffed by police. Um, and the police come from a section of the police, um, which is called the Regional Organised Crime Unit and the Regional Cyber Crime Unit, right? So, so actually, um, the police now, to combat cyber crime, have heavily recruited, right, mm -hmm. people that understand um, cyber security and ethical hacking, heavily recruited, right? So, but also in the centres, we are 50% staffed by cybersecurity and ethical hacking students, right? So basically what we do is we pull third and fourth year cybersecurity and ethical hacking students and we sit them uh, virtually, obviously now, <laughs> we sit them virtually in, in, our, in our regional centers. So they get training, if you like, for that. Now, we haven't uh, finalized this yet, but we're also working on a program and i'm talking to uh, founders for schools and work finder about this right we're working um on a program to uh, for those centers to also give digital marketing business development sales if you like um, work experience as well mm -hmm. so we've got to finalize that but it's one of our priorities you know during this time when obviously it's very or you know, it might be very difficult to find work experience, all right, um, for us to work hard on, on making work experience available. Um, so obviously I can tell you more about that another time, but yeah. Absolutely. And someone's actually asking, what is um, ethical hacking? I'm, I'm conscious of time, we've got about five minutes left, but in 30 seconds, what is ethical hacking? Uh, so ethical hacking is pretending you're a bad guy, <laughs> but actually you're a good guy. Right. Uh, it's really, it's really, really important 
to understand uh, deeply the mindset of the bad guys, the mindset of the criminals, right? And that basically is, is a very controversial set of courses, but basically that's what you're doing. You're teaching good people to be bad people. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Uh, let's have a look. We've got four more questions. Um, so you both started on great careers without having qualifications. Are soft skills more important than qualifications? Hugh, do you want to take this one? That's, that's a good question. I think um, good manners, politeness, uh, things like that, um, uh, a motivation to kind of get on with people. Uh, I think that, 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 that for me is, has been central. If you can earn a reputation for integrity um, and, 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 and getting on with people, being a good person, that for me is, is important. And people, people warm to that and people gain a comfort in your company if you can conduct yourself in that way. So yes, I would say the soft skills are kind of crucial to um, complementing whatever education you have. It's not just about qualifications, it's about the way kind of people read you and view you. Those things are really important for, for being able to have a, a sustainable uh, career with integrity, that, for sure, absolutely. And, and Hugh, where, where do you get your motivation from? Because obviously you spoke about being rejected and you had to motivate and pick yourself back up. And I know we touched on it, but someone's asking, where do you get your motivation from, basically? Well, that, that, that's a very, very good and uh, very, very interesting question. Um, it's a very personal question in that, um, um, without getting too deep and meaningful, the whole process of my parents kind of separating was, was very difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, as a, as a spin-off from that, I, I was left with a sense that I could do better, that I was, I was not going to kind of be dragged down um, uh, by that whole process. So, so although my school career was, 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 was not perfect, um, I had this deep-seated belief that I was capable of more. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what's really kind of stayed with me. That's fascinating. And that's so great that you were able to make that sort of shift in, in your sort of mindset. Um, and another couple of sort of personal questions of so if you don't want to answer it's fine how much did your family life affect your effort at school and do you think it's good to look for a mentor if you have upheaval in your family life chris what do you think um yeah, yes okay so um i i sort of guess my family life did affect me at school right although i actually don't don't blame my family I don't blame my dad mm -hmm. if you like you know for the fact that I dropped out of school you know I, I think that was my um, decision if you like uh, uh, to do that um, so um, but you know some, sometimes definitely you know your family is always your family but you've got to go your own way you know and uh, and so you know you just have to sometimes you have to like bite your tongue if you like and bide your time a bit um, and we say and I'm too sure that Hugh has heard of that right don't tell everybody your dreams be mm. very careful who you tell your dreams to right because because a lot of people and they think they're well intentioned but they're not they're probably jealous if you like you know will will knock down your dreams if you tell them that you know you want to do you want to be you know a rock star or you want you know awesome. you want to be a cyber security expert so be careful who you tell your dreams to excellent totally agree, totally agree. Yeah. yep thank you so much we are sadly out of time um i tried to cover as many questions as as possible um i'm sorry if i didn't get through to to your questions but thank you so much to the audience at home for joining us today and thank you to Hugh and Chris for such insightful um, career stories and for you know really opening up. Uh, we really do appreciate it. As I mentioned before, it, this session has been recorded and it will be uploaded to our YouTube channel, um, hopefully by the end of today. So look out for that. Um, and also we do send out some feedback surveys to all the audience members. So please look out for those surveys and do complete those because we, we find them really, really useful. 
Um, please ensure that you're following us on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Instagram. And also our next session is actually today at two o'clock. It's, um, it's another role model event and we've got a Math for Girls event taking place on Monday at two o'clock as well. So if you just want, if you want to join, just pop onto our website for all the, all the details. Thank you again, Chris and Hugh, and we're going to have to call it a day. Thank you so much. Take care and hopefully see nice you. Nice to meet you, Neil. Nice to meet you, Hugh. Speak soon. Likewise. So much. Take Thank care. You. Take care. Cheers. Bye.